a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with bite. Hello, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. I'm your host tonight, Rachel Edwards, filling in for Allison Tiemann. Tonight's topic is Ask the Badger Anything. And tonight with me, we have Hannah Wallen, Karen Strawn, and Crystal Garcia. But before we go into that, we'll go with to Hannah with, a, with an announcement. Thanks to our many generous donors, the Honey Badger Brigade has surpassed, surpassed even our informal stretch goal of uh, 65000 I'm sorry. Go on. Yes. I just completely lost my uh, text here. Um, thanks to our many generous donors, the Honey Badger Brigade has surpassed even our formal uh, s- stretch goal of $6,500 with our, uh, our total at over 8000 There it is. The campaign will remain active for another 28 or 24 days with the Bring It Tea available only through the fundraiser or at the conference. Uh, Karen Strawn, Allison Tiemann, Crystal Garcia, Rachel Edward- Edwards, Jess Kay, and I will be attending. Karen will be speaking. Allison, Crystal, Rachel, and Jess will be manning the Honey Badger table. Please stop by and say hello. It's so exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm excited. I'm excited. I can't wait to be there. <laughs> yeah, it's too. it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Um, are, are we allowed to are we, to mention the uh, the new venue or? I think so. Yeah, uh, it's been announced. It's been it's been announced. It's been announced. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's very exciting. Uh, I think it's actually gonna work out pretty well uh, from what I'm. Yeah, seeing. it looks cool. I saw I saw it. It looks looks like a good. Yeah, it'll seat a lot more people, and I think, uh, I don't know about uh, the situation, but I think we'll all be able to, to probably hear a lot more of the talks, and it's going to be great. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that the BFW uh, has is it has a whole bunch more seating in one place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of the issues that, that uh, occurred with the double, double tree is what happened at the uh, New Hampshire uh, Liberty Forum that I was at. Where yes, there were a lot of uh, there was there's all kinds of seating for people to see speakers to to hear speakers, but maybe only a hundred seats in each room, right? And there were a couple of rooms where you could like pull up the wall, you could retract the wall, and you could turn a one hundred person room into a two hundred and fifty person room just by pulling that out. But there, you know, like you, you still had a very, very limited uh, amount of people who could actually look at, you know, attend one talk. And uh, I think as far as I know, this particular conference is not going to have talks going simultaneously. They're not going to have like three or four speakers uh, giving talks at the same time in different rooms that that people are going to, you know, be, have to choose, have to pick and choose what they're going to look at. Uh, as far as I know, it's going to be sort of a sequential thing and everybody will have the ability to see every speaker if they want without having to pick and choose who they want to hear more. Right. And this particular venue, the v- VFW is going to be ideal for that because uh, it's, it's just, it just has a larger capacity. On top of that, it has a huge, huge amount of distance between public property and the building, something like 200 feet between the public road where protesters would be allowed to protest and the building itself. Uh, so, you know, you, you just have this this nice buffer zone in between the yelling and the shouting and the bullhorns and the banging and the, you know, and all of that and the, the talks that will be going on. And on top of that, uh, I think that it's just, it's just really ideal to hold an event like this in a place like the VFW. Um, veterans of foreign wars, you know, like what is 
what is more emblematic of this the sort of the 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 enforced social role of men than veterans of foreign wars so i think that that it's you know we picked detroit as a symbol of male identity and ironically the the vfw in detroit or just outside of detroit is even more emblematic even more symbolic of male identity in this culture so i just i just think it's just it's beautiful all around yeah whoever came up with the idea uh you know they're a, they're a genius i'd really like to shake their hand all uh, right let's uh i oh, think it was prince paw so that's great when, when you see him shake his hand <laughs> yeah all right, uh, let's go to some of these questions. Oh, gosh, so many. Uh, I don't even know if we'll get to them all. And if we don't, uh, I'm very, very sorry. There's just, we had a, a, a big, you know, an abundance of questions. So, all right, uh, dear honey badgers, what do you think about the new proposed prostitution laws in Canada and the confluence of social conservative and feminist rhetoric? Ah. Uh. <laughs> oh, God. We're, uh, we're not really uh, well, at least us Americans here aren't as familiar with uh, with them, well, sorry, with uh, okay, the, the, the new law in Canada, because uh, maybe it was eight months ago uh, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down uh, two of Canada's prostitution laws one was the law that prohibited solicitation so, like, because Prostitution was not illegal in Canada. Um, solicitation of prostitution and a whole bunch of other sort of ancillary uh, offenses were illegal, but prostitution, selling sex for money, was not technically illegal. Um, and so they struck down two laws. One of the laws was uh, solicitation of prostitution, and it was it was struck down on the grounds that uh, if sex workers are not allowed to negotiate beforehand what they're willing to do and what they are not for whatever price they are actually being endangered and this is this is actually absolutely true uh if you are a sex worker and you are unable to legally negotiate with your clients as to what you are willing to do and what you are not willing to do um, that that opens up all kinds of nasty doors, right? The other was uh, living off the proceeds, living off the avails of prostitution. Uh, that was a law that was that was in place to prevent pimps from profiting off of prostitution. But on the other hand, you would have uh, women who were prostitutes who might have a driver, right? And bodyguard, uh, they might be like an independent contractor. They have, uh, it's, she just hired somebody to protect her on her calls and drive her to and from, and it would be illegal for her to pay him to protect her. So, um, again, this is, this is a, uh, it was, it was a, it was a law that, that prevented sex workers from being able to legally make themselves safe in, you know, plying their trade or, or, you know, or, or doing their work, right? All of that is well and good. And the, the Supreme Court gave the, the Canadian government a certain amount of time to come up with something else, come up with something different to deal with prostitution. And what can, the Canadian government came up with was the Nordic model, where selling sex for money is perfectly legal, but purchasing sex with money is now criminal, right? Which would sort of be an an analogous to uh, if if you decided you were going to apply this to, say, the drug trade, uh, using drugs would be illegal, selling drugs, dealing drugs would be perfectly fine, right? So it, it, it's completely insane. And Peter McKay, when he was announcing this legislation, when he was referring to, uh, when he was questioned, I forget what the question was, 
But he said, well, this law is aimed at stopping perverts from purchasing sex, right? Which sort of leads me to believe that he thinks or the government thinks that anybody who can't get sex for free or ostensibly for free, um, anybody who actually has to bargain openly, right, rather than subtly for sex, um, that, you know, so unattractive men, they are by definition perverts if they desire sex, right? Um, men who are poor, right? They, they are by definition perverts if they desire sex, right? Because they might be the ones who pay $15 for a blowjob because they, they, they don't have what it takes to convince women to sleep with them for, you know, either for free or for a more subtle form of payment, right? Such as marriage or long-term relationship or whatever, right? So it, it just, it, it's obscene. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's basically, there is no other uh, area of vice where the users are penalized more than the dealers, right? Penalized more harshly than the dealers. Other than this, this one thing where women are the dealers, by and large and men are the consumers, the users, by and large. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just disgusted. I'm, I'm absolutely appalled. I was so, so heartened by the Supreme Court striking down those two laws, right, and this, this move on the part of the government to replace those laws with something, just, it just makes me sick to my stomach. It does. Go ahead. You know, this is it's a massive attack by feminists on everyone's bodily autonomy. Because they, they make this big deal about bodily autonomy, autonomy when they're talking about feminist issues, specific feminist issues. And, and it's amazing how adamant they can be about, say, a woman's right to choose to do what she wants with her own body, except when a woman wants to do something feminists don't approve. And, and, of course, when they talk about bodily autonomy, they're, they're excluding men altogether. Men don't have the right to do what they want with their own bodies, especially if a woman is involved, even if she's interested and willing. And, and then they jump right into bed with social conservatives um, with, with the same dictatorial attitude and the same puritanical outlook on sex, that, that suddenly uh, it's something dirty and secret that has to be you know, if you're if you're buying it, there's something wrong with you. If there's there's money involved in a trade for it, something is is bad about it. A as if uh, as if it's it's like an addictive drug, or or as if it is is like any other um, illegal substance, and and scream that you know men can't tell women what to do because men don't know what it's like to be a woman, and therefore can't tell women what's best for them. Then they turn around. And they tell sex workers what's best for them. It's it's such utter hypocrisy on all counts. It's just feminism's mainstay is hypocrisy. Well, it's all they have. What's frustrating to me is that is that the entire sort of traditional and and sort of uh, tradcon, you know, Nancy Reagan, just say no. All of those those memes, right, about things that are. Uh, addictions or weaknesses in people's, uh, pe you know, just just general human weaknesses, right? And general human uh, desires to indulge weaknesses, right? Such as drug addiction, right? All of the traditionalist position, all of the conservative position is you don't blame the user, right? You, you admonish the user, you know, just say no. You, you try to convince the user not to do it, but who do you put in jail, right? The dealer, the distributor, the person selling, right? Except in this one case. So it's not even, it's not even like they are approaching this the way they approach illicit substances or other illicit acts. They're not. And the only reason, in my opinion, that they're approaching it 
in a completely reverse fashion is because the dealers are female and the users, consumers, addicts, whatever you want to call them, are male. Right? And so we're going to hold the addicts responsible and let the dealers off. Right? It's not even a crime for them to distribute. Right? It, it, it's, it, it just is absolutely fucking upside down and backwards. Right? And it's only because there's a gendered element to it. Go ahead, Crystal. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Crystal. <laughs> here in the States, the um, everybody involved gets arrested. And that makes it really also, if something happens to a prostitute, like say she does get mugged or something, uh, she can't call for help because she will be put in jail too. Um, but yeah, it does sound like what they did is try to, like, without saying it, made prostitution illegal. Um, and so the, what they're doing is exactly, they're putting these women in really dangerous positions. Um, it kind of reminds me of what uh, feminists did in Myanmar, where, I mean, they came, came in, and I, I don't know the specifics on how they actually were able to push this, um, but they have put, sex workers were put in rehabilitation camps, uh, pretty much, you know, because, you know, you have these feminists who are together with um, these religious I don't know if it's groups or whatever. And uh, they're tell they're pretty much telling women, oh, you're too stupid to know that the fact that you're not really having sex, you're just being raped. You're just too stupid to know about it. So we're we're going to, we're going to take care of that for you. Um, and so these women were put in rehabilitation camps, uh, where they were beaten, raped, they were malnutritioned. Uh, so, I mean, this was something I, I had spoken about before where feminists are responsible for the rape of women. They are, cons they're consistently responsible for, you know, uh, what happens to prostitutes who have to go out in the streets. Uh, and yeah, they, they, they cannot fathom, a sexual woman to the extent that they will put these sex workers in harm's way because that's not possible. She must be being raped. She must be being duped because a woman is too stupid to think for herself. And if she's not doing what we say with her vagina, then there's something absolutely wrong. So I, I it's, it's just really fucked up. And uh, I, I don't understand how feminism can dare say that they, they stand for women's human rights. Oh, unless she's a whore. Right. Unbelievable. Yeah, it really it really is. Absolutely. And, and I don't think a lot of people understand just the history, or, or some do, absolutely, w with prostitution. It, it, goes, it goes back, geez, uh, since the beginning of civilization there have been prostitutes. It's, it's always been a public need, and it's always been a, a public good for, for women who voluntarily choose that life. And there, there have always been, you know, I guess to some extent, high, high class prostitutes, and they were always in, you know, these brothels. And, and I think they were were happier. Uh, Theodora, the the empress of the Byzantine Empire, started out as a prostitute, and she literally fucked her way to the top. And I, and the thing about it is, is, this has always been a public good, and they've just tried to eradicate it as as if we suddenly don't need sex workers, as if this is suddenly something we need to stomp out. But there's always going to be a need for it, whether or not it's illegal. The difference is that what we can do is we can make it illegal, I'm sorry, not illegal, legal, and regulate it and make sure that these girls are are cared for, that they that they have insurance, that they're getting tested. We can, we can do these things, and it would be a lot better, it would be a lot safer, and it would eliminate the pimps. It would eliminate so much of the violence going into this. Uh, anybody else have any final thoughts on this? I think I think actually um, one of the things is that you won't get feminist. You won't. You, you might get some. You know, the odd sex positive feminist who is who is going to say yes, we should legalize sex work. Um, we should absolutely do that. And I think that that's absolutely one hundred percent right. It should. I don't know how regulated it should be or how taxed it should be. Um, but it definitely should be something that is a business. It's treated as a business, a commodity. Um, you know, and 
somebody mentioned that, you know, there's very, very little said about male sex workers. Well, there's very little said about male sex workers because um, male sexuality is not as valuable. It's not seen as valuable uh, as female sexuality, right? And so, you know, you, you just sort of look at that and you think, Who's who's predominantly paying for sex? It's men. And who's predominantly selling sex? It's women. And what feminists, I think one of the things that they absolutely, absolutely detest is the degradation of female sexuality. Because female sexuality is where female power comes from. Uh, like Theodora sleeping her way to the top, she wouldn't be able to sleep her way to the top if if female sexuality was worth nothing, like male sexuality is seen as being worth nothing, right? So, you know, you, you just sort of look at that. They don't want to let go of that power. And f- sex workers, just like porn actresses, uh, just like, uh, masturbatory tools for men, fleshlights and the like, right? That's that's all scabs. That's scabs crossing the picket line. You know, they, they are crossing the picket line, driving the price of female sexuality down because they are willing to sell female sexuality for an honest, reasonable price rather than demanding top dollar for it. And you see this, you even see this in, uh, they did a study, they found that uh, women did not have a problem with using female sexuality, highly sexualized images of women, if they were uh, advertising Rolex watches or BMWs, right? They were okay with highly sexualized images of women in advertisements for extremely expensive items. But when it comes to uh, Carl's Jr. burgers or the like, they were highly offended by the use of sexual imagery of women. Right? It, it's, it's all about price. It's all about value. And it's all about protecting the basic market value of female sexuality. Uh, it's, yes, about, it's about being able to extort the highest price you can. And, of course, you know, just like those those coal miners on strike are going to scream scab, right? Scab, fuck you, scab, at the people crossing the picket line to work for $2 an hour less, right? Because they really need that job, right? Of course, feminists and a whole bunch of other women are going to instinctively scream slut, at women who are willing to either give sex away for free or give it away for a fair price that where the contract ends when the sexual act ends. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. We just have to have so many questions we got to go to. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Oh, gosh. Okay. This is for everyone. If I ask you for coffee in an elevator, will you think me to be a rapist and if yes will you come to my room anyway <laughs> oh totally totally <laughs> I will come I, I, to your room if I think you're a rapist I decline <laughs> to answer this question I, I do not admit to being a coffee addict and you can't prove anything <laughs> well, it depends how good is the coffee <laughs> I can quit any time I want <laughs> exactly I can quit any time I want. Uh, if it's espresso, I'll, I'll, I'd come up. <laughs> yeah. In all uh, seriousness, though, that the, there is feminist writing arguing that women who would would go to a guy's room, even if they didn't trust him, to not be a sexual predator, um, are 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 not wrong for doing that. And are not making a mistake. That there's feminist writing out there supporting the idea that. We should instead approach the 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 predator and try to teach him better, and and wanting to um, generalize the, the behavior of someone who is a predator towards all of the other men. 
uh, that that's one of the things about feminism that drives me nuts. They have to weaken women every way they can. They have to demonize men every way they can, or they can't can't exploit that dynamic for for political fodder. So I mean, of course, nobody would actually go running up to some guy's room, nobody with any brains anyway, if they thought he might hurt them. That that, that he was probably going to, you know. Um, yeah. And it's it's. The sad thing is, it's it's a very um, relevant question because there there are there are arguments out there that women should be able to just disregard uh, warning signs and and just you know blithely flounce through life, doing whatever they please, not worrying about the potential consequences, and and then whine about it when bad things happen to them. You know, and just because the predator's behavior is the predator's fault doesn't necessarily mean that that you going to his room wasn't your fault. You know, I I have a really dumb story to go with this. Um, when I was when I was five years old, I had like no good idea, bad idea, idea filter whatsoever. So I came home from some place, and there was there were hot coals in the driveway, and uh, I didn't think I'd been gone long enough for there to be a barbecue. So I decided to see if they were hot by you know. Touching them with my toes, but you, you you know if you barbecue meat, you put your your the meat over the the coals. It starts to cook long before it gets near the coals. So I had third degree burns, and uh, of course at five years old I felt like a victim. I was very upset about the fact that I had third degree burns on my foot. You know, and stood there or sat there and screamed and yelled until my my dad came out. And once everything was settled. Every adult in my life that, that was a caregiver for me said exactly the same thing about it. Well, you won't do that again, will you? Yeah. You know, the idea being, <laughs> oh, gee, that hurt. Learn from it. And, and yeah, feminism wow. does the opposite. Feminism would say, you know, don't, don't teach Hannah not to stick her foot on hot coals. Teach, you know, teach the coals. Let's, let's pour water on the coals to keep them, keep them cool. Teach people not to dump hot coals in the driveway where Hannah might walk. Don't teach Hannah to avoid danger, you know, and, and that's what they're doing to women. Yeah. They don't want us to learn better than, than, than to take unnecessary risks. And in order to um, exploit that victim status, you know, they, they are actually willing to say that if, if women want to learn better than to take unnecessary risk, that that's removing blame from any other person involved in, in the circumstances they get into, which is, is uh, you know, grade A bullshit, which, it's by retarded. the way, is not good in coffee. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's retarded. It's, it's basically, uh, it's, you know, you can only become empowered through uh, relying on everybody else to keep you safe, right? You can only become empowered by never learning from your mistakes. You can only become empowered by uh, basically allowing yourself to be a leaf on the wind, right? Uh, it, it, it's, the most, it's, it's the most absurd thing. As far as coffee in an elevator, like I said, anybody who invites me for coffee in an elevator, like I, I, at, in New Hampshire, I had a number of men approach me and want to talk to me and and you know I I would want to go up and change my clothes or whatever go up to my room and you know we'd get on the elevator we'd go on up we'd be talking they would they would be very hesitant to enter my hotel room right is it okay and I'm like just yeah fuck come on in like I have a bathroom here I can change into my jeans in the bathroom Right, not a problem. Uh, you know, keep talking. I can hear you through the door. Right, you know, I wanna, I wanna continue the conversation, and then I would open my computer. I would, you know, Skype my boyfriend. The guy or two guys who were in the room with me would be talking with me and with my boyfriend. You know, and there was never any any sense that uh, I was in any danger. Right, like these guys, most of them were hesitant to enter my hotel room because they didn't want to make me uncomfortable. Right, and I was just like, "Yeah, no, come on in." 
right? It's, it's a hotel room. It's not a private space. It's a public space. Like 150,000 people have slept in this room before. It's not my space. And it, it, I never, like, it just never occurred to me that somebody wanting to continue a conversation on the way up an elevator, right, was a menace, was, you know, had some kind of malicious intent, or even was looking to get into my pants, right? It, it, it just, it, ugh. If you're interesting, they want to talk to you because they want to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really? Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Am I echoing? Uh, I don't think Am so. I- Oh, sorry. For a second there, I heard a bit of an echo. But anyway, um, if it was a, if it was me, I'd be perfectly honest. If I was genuinely interested in the person, uh, I'd probably just you know go up with them. But if I, if I really wasn't interested, I'd probably politely decline and just let them know, you know, and maybe just you know have coffee downstairs in the general area. Maybe we could just talk. I mean, like I'd probably say, well, you know, I'm in a relationship right now, but you know, I appreciate your. Your compliment, <laughs> but you know that's just me. Well, you know, but a lot of a lot of men who are going to ask you in an elevator, right? Can we yeah. continue this conversation? Or I'd like to talk more. They're actually not hitting on you. If you have anything interesting to say, if they're at all interested in what you have to say, they, you know, like. Maybe there's some part of them that would be open, like, oh, my God, if she tries to jump my bones, I'd go with it, <laughs> right? But they're, they're not there to, to, to try to get into your pants. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. If you actually take people at face value, they don't fail you. Um, like, I think I had six or seven guys in my hotel room in New Hampshire, Right? I'm picturing that now. <laughs> I didn't have a single one of them hit on me. Were like, they jumping on your bed? Just no. Like, <laughs> you know, like, no, we're just being silly. Just... They, they literally, they, they were just, we were talking and I was like, I got to go up to my room because I got to change out of these clothes or I got to like, you know, brush my teeth or whatever. And then I'm going to go out to wherever. Right. But, you know, come on, let's, let's continue the conversation. Right. And you know, and then again, I had to invite them in because they were uncomfortable. They didn't want to come in if they thought it was intruding. And, and, you know, and, and then it was just like, they're standing in the hotel room while I'm in the bathroom, changing my clothes and splashing water on my face or whatever to refresh myself. And then, and then, you know, we would spend 10 minutes in the room together and nothing happens right we just our conversation it, it's 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 the most amazing thing when you actually see men as human beings right and they see you as a human being and all you want to do is like talk and share ideas none of all of that other shit even occurs to you Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we'll move on to the next question. All right. Uh, let's see here. This is a rather big one. Uh, I'll take a different one. All right. Uh, do you believe that there are actual risks of injury or death by attending the Detroit conference? Yes. It's a hard, That's a tough question. I mean, I think there's always, you know, the possibility. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not going to be so so naive as to believe that they're not going to bring out the big guns if they have them. I'm not talking about physical guns, but, you know, just everything they've got. Detroit Detroit is a city with a lot of guns in it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> D- D- Detroit's a city with a lot of violence in it, too. But yeah. the thing is, there's, there's risk of injury and death all the time. You're, you, you get in your car and you're dry, you drive someplace... That is probably one of the riskiest things you can do in the United States. Yeah. Um, that, that's riskier. That's probably going to be riskier. The drive to the conference is probably going to be a greater risk to people who are driving there than being at the conference after the, the feminist death threats. You have, because, you have as much risk of premature death 
driving 100 kilometers of highway in the United States as you did being exposed to the Fukushima nuclear yes. accident. Well, and a lot of people are going to be coming right up. The, the highway known as Drug Alley, um, I-75, is known as Drug Alley. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, there there is one down by Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> big, big, huge Jesus. Not as big as the original that got struck by lightning, but but yeah, there, there's there's some in- interesting uh, interesting uh, things to look at there. I, I feel like such a country <laughs> bumpkin when I'm thinking about all this because we don't we don't have as much of that sort of thing in this area. We don't have a well, no, there is a specific area, kind of, but it's it's more of a. I guess you could call it the ghetto of the particular area, but it's it's a very small bit near of area, and as long as you're fine. Huh? Near, near where I live, we have the world's largest Easter eggs, so just <laughs> cool. don't worry about it. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, honestly, in, well, in, in 1997, I was in, a, in an accident that I, that I ended up with a, uh, a herniated disc from, and I found out that year that I, I lived in what was that year, the per capita car accident capital of the United States. And and everybody would think, you know, oh, I, you know, Hannah must have lived in LA or New York or something. No, it was a a small city in Ohio that is actually uh far smaller than Detroit. Well, Detroit in its heyday it, it might not, you know, population wise they might not be so far apart now. Um I one of the ugliest accidents I was ever in, um one that almost killed my mother was out in the country it was not in it was in a rural part rural part of ohio and uh, so i mean it's driving is more dangerous than than taking threats now and this is not to say that we shouldn't be worried and we shouldn't you know take precautions and a voice for men has taken precautions they've got a security team they're they're uh, working with local police and and they're holding the uh, event at the VFW. I mean, this is they're definitely taking measures against danger here, and they are taking it seriously because you know you look at feminism and, and feminist history is just absolutely fraught with violent behavior. But as far as as whether people should be worried to attend, or like I'm not worried, um, and and I wouldn't. I wouldn't advise anybody else to be worried about it either. Just, you know, take the precautions that you would take in any big city. Well, I'm so I'm so worried that I've decided I decided that I was gonna wear a target on my t shirt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, uh Allison and I were were sort of debating what slogan we would put on there. You know, bring it or come at me bra or aim here, bitches. You know, <laughs> like uh you know, it was it was because you are always at risk. You are always, especially if you are counterculture, if you are counter narrative, uh, you you are always at some risk, right, of being attacked for your views, right. Nobody is going to attack uh, somebody who, you know, the, the, the entire status quo, he, he, you know, that person is the embodiment of the entire status quo. Nobody's going to attack that person, right? Your counterculture, your counter narrative, you, you challenge, uh, the prevailing wisdom or the prevailing attitude. You're going to invite attack, whatever. It's, it's really not as, as uh, it, it's really not as dangerous as uh, as the people who were making the threats wanted to seem, and that that's really the thing. Yeah, I mean, like Erin yeah. Pizzi, she she endured years of death threats, right? And what's the worst that happened? Her dog was shot, yeah. right? After years. Years of concerted death threats. I have never received a death threat. Yeah, I've me received, neither. I'd like I, to keep I, it that way, but you know. I have. But uh, obviously, it, it nobody uh, acted on it. Why <laughs> not? So, intimidating and menacing emails and and messages. I've received menacing uh, comments. Right, the comments that that seem to be sort of trying to get you know, into my personal, do you really want to go there, Karen? 
are we really going to go there because, you know, I'm going to, you know, whatever, switch <laughs> you know, and, your, and your phone number around, right? Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've received those kinds of things, and I've received some extremely poorly spelled and punctuated rape threats. Uh, but nothing that I would consider credible, right? Like, yeah. and, you know, like 90%, 90 to 99% of the hostility against me occurs in places where nobody's drawing my attention to it. It's it's occurring on Sail Pulani's channel or Nocturnus Libertus's channel or this person's channel and they make a video calling me all kinds of names and, and talking all kinds of crap about me and don't draw my attention to it whatsoever, right? Or they uh they you know they they basically they'll they'll do I was doxxed in a video that nobody actually drew my attention to until after I had already put my full name out there. Right? Jeez. You know, but it, it, it's just, they they aren't threatening, they aren't drawing my attention to these things. They aren't sending me, nobody, the, the person who made the video doxing me didn't send me that video. Right? I heard about it through happenstance. Right? It's, they're not trying to, it's, it's just, it's, it's not something that I, because they're not, they're not launching a campaign that, that they are directing directly at me, right, to harm me, right? They might criticize me, they might say all kinds of crap on my channel, <clears throat> Deb Magil, Sel Polani, all those others. I give them free reign to say whatever kind of batshit, fucking insane shit they want, right? But they aren't threatening me. They they don't threaten me. So, you know, I I can honestly say, and I've been thinking about it, the uh, the most dangerous situations I've been in in my life, and the most threatening things that have happened to me, the things that have been. Um, you know, the most potentially deadly. And and I've had some potentially deadly things um, happen to me. Uh, I almost died from a mosquito bite once. That's a long story. But none of them have been things where somebody came along and said, I am going to do this to you, and then did it. It's never been because somebody was trying to, to intimidate me and threaten me and, and prevent me from doing anything. It's always been pure chance or, or something that I got myself into by doing something stupid. Well, generally, uh, generally the people who are going to actually carry out extremely violent acts, um, they're not the people that are going to uh, email you 35 times before no. they do it to, to let you know to be on your guard. They're yeah. just people who are going to pick up a gun and, and, and attack you. Right, and so I mean, there's there's always that chance, right? Because you know, any of, like I'm saying, the people who are going to do it aren't going to necessarily warn you, right, that they're going to do it. Okay, well that's fine. Uh, the people who choose to uh, violently act against me or Allison or Hannah or Rachel or Jess or or you know. Crystal or any woman involved, uh, Janet, any woman involved in this, uh, they are shooting them. That like that's a self inflicted wound, as far as I'm concerned, right? Like, um, you know, like you you look at the PR, right? The PR attached to somebody taking out a female MRA, right? Especially a popular one. That that's just gonna be uh that's just gonna be huge. Huge. That's something that the mainstream would not be able to ignore, number one. They would not be able to just sweep it under the rug. Somebody died, somebody was shot, somebody was injured, blah blah blah, right? On top of that 
you know, you have all of the, a woman was attacked, a woman was injured, a woman was killed, right? And then you have the fact that this woman is a martyr for this particular cause, right? Like, Martin Luther King couldn't have asked for anything better as far as furthering the civil rights movement than a female MRA getting gunned down, gunned down at a conference, you know, That's honestly, the, like, the I, smartest thing they could do would be just not even come. Just, just stay away. Yeah. It's, it would be the most uh, politically uh, prudent thing they could yeah, do, would be to stay away. They've, they've made their social faux pas. They've said something stupid now, and 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 it's, you know... That's it. And they've they've even done. had their own. They've even had their own protest, you know. And they brought everybody out out of the woodwork. They brought the socialists. They brought everybody who was just even mildly linked to this sort of thing and brought them in. So, yeah. you know, so, it, I think they they've done what they they felt they needed yeah. to do, and you know, they could just, you know, let us, you know, do our part and just leave us be, you know. Just, well, this is, you know, this is extremely misogynistic rhetoric. Really, we shouldn't be teaching honey badgers to avoid violence. We should teach feminists not to threaten, right? <laughs> but don't we have a, a, a list of more um, relevant to the movement questions? To, yes, to yes, we do. With? Because I mean, this is this we is have really a, we have a we have a ton. We have a ton. Oh uh, gosh, uh, do you get approached by many LGBT people who are critics of feminism? And have interest in the MRM. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I haven't seen as many, but um. Well, yes, Karen. Do you know any particular ones? I think. Um, well, I, I I have had actually I've had uh, transgendered people message me and ask me to do uh, videos on their issues, and I have sort of politely declined because I don't feel like I have the authority to speak to that. Um, I just haven't done uh, enough research to feel knowledgeable enough other than to say that transgenderism is a biological uh, function. It's it's not a choice, right? Uh, just like homosexuality, and therefore there's really nothing to be gained from uh, persecuting transgendered people. Uh, and nothing to be gained from saying transgendered women, trans women are privileged because they were born male and they have male privilege or that trans men are attempting to uh, appropriate male privilege uh, you know, and abandon their female subjugation. It's just ridiculous, the, the feminist ideas, uh, the radical feminist ideas around that. Um... I used to speak quite a bit about, uh, before I got involved in the men's rights movement, about bisexual erasure. And uh, I had a lot of uh, bisexual and gay and lesbian uh, people who thought that I had something valuable to say about that. And, uh, yeah, like, you know, there there really is, there there is... Uh, definitely space for LGBT people in this movement. Um, and not just LGBT men, uh, LGBT women as well, right? Like a, a trans woman uh, was once designated as male and may have all kinds of baggage attached to that and the socialization of masculinity and all of the things that they were raised uh, into... Uh, that did not fit uh, a trans man, you know, might uh, have issues around not having services f for them uh, that, you know, that doesn't, that don't out them as a trans man, right? Like you, if you want to, if you want to go in and, and get a, a cervical exam, you know, a pap smear, whatever, as a trans man, and you have to go to the women's center of your your university to do that, uh, you're outing yourself, and and that's an issue, right? So I mean, like, there's there's all kinds of issues tangled up in gender and and whatever, and I think that, that I think that the men's rights movement needs to 
actually support everybody, right? And say that everybody is just trying to be who they are. You know, every, it's all like Marlo Thomas and free to be you and me. And, and we should all just try and support everyone's point of view uh, if it's their personal point of view and not a dogmatic externally imposed point of view like feminism or or whatever right so yeah i mean uh yeah oh sorry i'm getting a bit of feedback uh the thing about it is is that i think often they believe that we're on the other side that we're um we're the heavily religious folks that would be really opposed to that sort of thing and i don't really have that particular problem and i think I don't think a lot of people would. I mean, I think some would, of course, but that's with any group of people that might disagree. But, you know, I, I don't really feel that the men's rights movement is opposed to anyone who's gay or trans or falls in, uh, under the general term of LGBT. All, all I have to say is that I'm thinking I was raised in my mother was raised Catholic, my dad was raised Lutheran, I was raised uh, agnostic and became atheist. And, you know, like, that that's just, I have, I have no religious affiliation whatsoever. And I think a, a significant number of MRAs have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Uh, and, and a lot of us, uh, like here's a voice for men has hosted articles by trans people. Uh, they have hosted articles by gay people. Um, even the spearhead, which was, you know, five years ago, like super hardcore, uh, super hardcore red pill. They had a lesbian who was a regular contributor to their articles, right? Like there there doesn't seem to be the kind of discrimination uh like look at me biggest youtube channel of any mrm channel right and i'm openly bisexual i i i look like your typical radical feminist you know like it, it just it it really like there there doesn't seem to be the level of uh of prejudice in this movement that there is in say the feminist movement or other movements the traditionalist uh tra traditional conservative uh movement or you know like there there isn't the same it it really is just sort of the marlo thomas free to be you and me that that seems to be the the name of the game you know, uh, one of the first things I encountered with the uh, the men's rights movement, and I think I talked about this last week when I was talking about my history with the movement, was um, father's rights issues as a gay rights issue, where um, ex-wives uh, in, in marriages that were breaking up where the uh, the husband was gay were using his sexuality to uh, to keep him from seeing his kids as if that there was any excuse for that. Um, and that was something, I mean, that is, that's a direct men's rights issue, and it's a direct gay rights issue. It's a, it's a cross between the two that you really can't separate the two in, in, the, in the gay men's community. And one of the other things that I encountered... Um, early in my experiences with Reddit and I, I, you know, talking to Reddit feminists and talking to men's rights activists on Reddit was a huge difference in um, willingness to discuss between feminists and men's rights activists on the topic of rape in the lesbian community. Um, and, and there's actually, you know, there's statistics on uh, intimate partner and sexual violence uh, in that community outside of the, the CDC's statistics, which are, are fundamentally flawed by really small sample sizes. Um, but you, you really couldn't get a lot of discussion uh, from feminists about that. They, like, they wanted to gloss over that entirely. And, and then the only people that would really explore it was MRAs. So it's an area where if, if you actually wanted to do something about that issue, if you actually wanted to take steps... To, to treat the problem, 
the the feminist community is really not inclined to help with that. Well, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's get another question here. Oh, am I, am I still connected? Right. Yes, you are. All right. Sorry, I just sort of <laughs> started to say yes, but <laughs> you did. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the instinct to feel sorry for women and put blame on men seems so deeply ingrained. It can't be detached from the human psyche. When one hears about how courts are consistently across nations giving women less punishment for the exact same crimes men commit, it seems hopeless. Do you think it's possible for people to be become truly objective in how they see men and women? How can it be done? If so, sorry, if so, how can it be done? Um, I actually don't have uh, thought on how it can be done, but I did want to speak to the, the issue of uh, difference, differences in criminal sentencing. Just to point out, um, this is an area where feminist activism has had an impact, and it's been a bad one. Uh, because they have, they've talked about um, reforming uh, prison, they've talked about reforming harsh sentences, and, and they've talked about... Um, They've, they've talked about recognizing the fact that people who commit crimes don't stop being human beings just because they committed a crime and, and you know, that they're still redeemable people. But they've limited that whole discussion to only women. Only women are redeemable and only women should have lower sentences and only women's life circumstances should be taken into account. And I've even read articles where they have said, Unlike men, women experience abuse, and that's why they commit crimes. Unlike men, women who commit crimes have, have suffered sexual violence, and, and it's bullshit. Um, there isn't anything that they're saying, uh, asking for lenience for women, or asking for reform in women's prisons, that is not applicable to, to men in the penal system, um, at least the same amount, and many times much more. So th this is an area that, in order to uh, in order to repair society's really misguided viewpoints on on how we treat people after they have committed a crime, we're first going to have to address this dysfunctional feminist rhetoric about, about applying gender to uh, to the discussion of whether or not people can be redeemable after they commit a crime and whether or not they deserve to be treated like human beings in the process. One of the interesting things that I, uh, I have often thought about is the Sharia dictate that a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's testimony. And th it seems really... Uh, kind of, it, it seems like, oh my goodness, we, we think that women lie, right? But there, there's a couple other ways you can look, look at uh, that particular law. You can look at it like they are acknowledging that a woman's testimony is going to be twice as likely to be believed just on its own, on its own you know, recognition, than a man's testimony, and therefore we are compensating for it. Or you can look at it like a woman is half as accountable for what she says and does as a man is. And when you look at Sharia punishments for specific crimes, um, you look at uh, one CBC radio story that I was listening to a woman who ran off. She she basically ran off. She eloped against her father's wishes with the man she fell in love with in Afghanistan and, uh, and married him and got pregnant and they were caught and, you know, the whole thing was just like a big, big debacle and, and a big horrible thing. She was sentenced to five years in a woman's prison. And women's prisons in Afghanistan, I think uh, anybody who wants to see what things are really like in Afghanistan needs to actually search on YouTube uh, videos of what it's actually like in a women's prison, which is a prison that has doors, not bars. 
It has rec rooms, not, you know, exercise yards. Uh, it has access to education rather than uh, mandatory labor, right? So, I mean, it's a completely, and, and she can keep her kids with her if she wants. Uh, whereas uh, male prisoners in prison in Afghanistan cannot even have uh, adult family members visit them, right? And this particular woman, she was sentenced to five years where she was given an education and given job training and kept in a place where she had her kids in, in the facility where there were no bars, there were doors, right? It was basically like a big daycare center or a big elementary school, right? Her husband, who was also convicted of eloping against her father's wishes, was sentenced to 20 years hard labor without any visitation rights to any of his family, right? And then you look at this law under Sharia that a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's, right? This means a woman is half as accountable as a man, except when it comes to penalizing, in which case a woman is one quarter as accountable as a man, right? And I actually think that compared with what goes on with Sharia, what goes on in those places, uh, places where in India you, you actually have 50% of the, the rape cases crossing an investigator's, uh, a police investigator's, investigator's de desk being, uh, I consented to sex and now I want him to marry me. So I'm going to accuse him of rape. And then 90% of those cases are, you know, are resolved by marriage between the rapist and his victim, Right. I mean, like, you, you look at the situation as it is in those places, and you think, like, I just, it, it just boggles my mind how we've been duped. We've been, we've been completely bamboozled. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I would. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think one of the most dangerous things we're dealing with right now is the complete denial of the female criminal. Um, I don't understand how this is even seen as normal or okay. To I, it's really, really blows my mind. Um, the absolute dismissal of the female criminal, and as you were saying, uh, that there's always an excuse for the female criminal, even when it's a woman doing the crime, it's still blamed on men. Uh, it's, it's, I don't, they're so completely blinded by the story that women cannot, can do no wrong, they can't harm, that they're just innocent little creatures who can never harm, and if they do harm, well, it must have, a man must have done something to her. I, I think it's just so completely dangerous for everything that we dismiss the female criminal. It keeps men also in a very dangerous position. Uh, when men are abused or raped or attacked by a woman, it's not seen as possible. It's so, it's so outrageously denied uh, not even denied, but covered up and, and supported that female criminals are just a myth, uh, that it's, it's extremely dangerous, and uh, there's no way we're going to have a healthy human community if we keep denying a fact that women have been criminals since the dawn of time. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's criminals exist, it's regardless of gender, but when, you know, the female criminals denied, it's... It's incredibly dangerous. Well, absolutely. Just uh, just really across the board. And I think this really does mess with accountability. Because if a woman knows that she can absolutely get away with this shit, if she if she goes and and commits the exact same crime that a man does, that she's gonna be she's gonna be taken care of. She's gonna be totally okay. And she'll be able to get, and depending on the crime, she can just get off with a slap on the wrist. What does that teach these girls that grow up understanding this? 
I mean, are, are they going to be more accountable or are they going to be less accountable? I, I'm going to go with the latter. Uh, any, any final thoughts on this before we move on? I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Jeez, oh, there's so many. Uh, let's let's go with a fun one. Um, what uh, what Hogwarts house are we? It says uh, looks like the Hufflepuff Badger. Can I assume you gals are Hufflepuffs? I was thinking more Ravenclaws or maybe Gryffindors. What? <laughs> that was totally Harry Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, some somebody. Okay, I'll, I I was taking a fun question, just a silly question, because we've been so serious. Oh <laughs> my God, no. <laughs> Sam Crow. Thank you very much. What? Sam <laughs> Crow. Sam Crow. <laughs> uh, I would say Ravenclaw all the way. I don't know about Hannah. That I um I honestly don't know. Uh, years ago, somebody demanded that I take a Facebook quiz on this, and I got, um, what was the one that the three kids in the story were in? They were in Gryffindor, weren't they? Yeah, they were. That's they were, the one I got. I think uh, most people think you're Gryffindor, Karen. <laughs> okay, okay, all I have to say, all I have to say is after, after, uh, J.K. Rowling came out and said that she had always envisioned Dumbledore as a gay character. She'd never incorporated that into the, uh, the the fictional narrative because it was extraneous, it was unnecessary, right? But she had always pictured him as gay, right? And, okay, this, this was when I was involved deeply in the erotica and romance writers community, and there were a lot of LGBT people in there, and some of them were social justice warrior types, and... And they were like, well, why wouldn't she have made him actively gay in the books? Blah, blah, blah. And a friend of mine wrote a blog post about it. And she said, so why didn't J.K. Rowling name her book, her first book, Big Gay Dumbledore's Big Gay Wizard Academy? <laughs> right? Like, why did she do, oh my God, why didn't she make his gayness? ultimate the ultimate thing right I, I I just I had a hard time taking anything about Harry Potter seriously after that because yeah because it, it just it just I don't know uh, if, if <laughs> that would be the only thing you could think about <laughs> Uh, it, it makes it makes sense though uh, if you if you do look at the backstory with him and Grindelwald. I think in the oh, final totally final does. books, it, it totally does, and I totally have all respect to the writer for envisioning a character a certain way and concealing certain aspects of his personality and certain aspects of his character that yeah. were not pertinent to the plot, just not even including them because they were not relevant. Right? I have total respect for J.K. Rowling. I have complete disrespect for all of the people who were like, oh my god, she could have used this as a way to, like, proselytize the LGBT agenda, right? That's not what the books were about. Like, it was, yeah. But as far as, as far as Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, fucking Huffin' Puff, <laughs> Slytherin. <laughs> I I don't I don't even remember like I haven't read any of the books. They they appeal to me. Um, you know. Oh, you know what I am? I'm I'm one of the children of Durin. Okay. That's that's okay. If if I got to pick a. Okay, you know, we'll we'll take a. I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'm. I'm uh, uh, I'm a human, right? Like, I Tolkien at least has some longevity, right? So, yeah, okay. all right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, why are you so awesome? And what could I do to help the European Union to help the movement? Disband the European <laughs> Union. Disband them. That would help. Yeah, uh, I would agree. 
they're an anti-democratic, uh, non-elected body of bureaucrats who uh, have way too much say, considering they don't have the uh, political backing of the people. And, uh, yeah, just uh, if, if you have a, a candidate in your area whose platform involves disbanding the European Union, vote them in. All You're here. Uh, we were, uh, Hannah, Hannah, did you hear the question? Uh, it is, I, what she said, honestly. Yeah. Uh, there yeah. really is anything else to add to that? Yeah, there, yeah, there we go. We're, we're good with that. Oh, geez. Uh, what else? How will the MRM present its, well, sorry, prevent itself from becoming a homogenous ideology? In other words, how do we encourage skepticism within the movement while working together for men's issues? By being male. <laughs> uh, there's nothing homogenous about the um, it's one of the it's one of the really really cool things it's one of the reasons why uh, the men's rights movement has been uh, extremely ineffectual up until this point is that uh, men don't have the in-group bias automatically uh, that women have and so therefore uh, there there is not as much of a sense of solidarity around just being male. Uh, there's a solidarity around being workers, or there's solidarity solidarity around being communists, or progressives, or right wing, or religious, or you know Americans, or Germans, or whatever. Right? There can be a solidarity among men over those things, but not about being male. And so, yeah, I, I think that. Uh, how the men's rights movement can avoid becoming like feminism is just by being male. Uh, once there is no longer a common cause to fight for that everybody sees as valid, uh, they're, they're going to dissolve into infighting and they're going to branch off into uh, different sects and, and they're, they're not going to be cooperating any, anymore. Right? That, that's just the way men are. Um, they bond over a common cause that is not about gender so much as about justice. And uh, they, they will not, they will fall apart, they will disintegrate once that common cause is no longer adamant. It's no longer, you know, uh, something that needs to be rallied around. Yeah. I think uh, I think what we can do, or the best thing that we can do, is you know be self policing. If you see someone who's being hateful or being uh, just irrational, and, and they're making just ridiculous arguments, and you know, if you see that, call them on it. Don't don't be afraid to disagree with someone. That's how you avoid becoming an echo chamber. If, you, if you're fine with disagreeing with each other and being able to handle that and discuss that rationally, you're going to be fine. Just absolutely fine. But you can't I, be afraid. <laughs> I, can't imagine, I can't imagine the men's rights community uh, starting to censor, uh, starting to declare this place is a safe space and what we define as a safe space is a place where nobody's allowed to disagree with the prevailing opinion. I think that what has been predominantly described as a safe space for men and for MRAs has always been a space where you can say pretty much whatever you want and, you know, other people will argue against it or whatever, but you won't be silenced. You won't be uh, censored. You won't be banned. You won't be uh, cut off at the knees you will be able to say your piece and other people will argue the point, right? And so basically the, the entire definition of a safe space for women and a safe space for men, safe space for women is a space without criticism. A safe space for men is a space for all opinions to be aired, right? Uh, and be subject to criticism. So... Yeah, it, it's a completely different thing. I don't think that I don't think that the MRM is going to ever fall into the trap that feminism has fallen into. I really don't. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think so either, though we, we often get compared to feminism, but really it's a completely different feeling. If you've ever been in a forum just full of feminists and you've ever been uh, in a forum or a chat with MRAs, it really is a completely different experience. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it absolutely is the way you're describing, you know. There are a bunch of different people, and they come from all different backgrounds, and they have different religious beliefs or lack thereof. They have they come from every part of the political spectrum, but they are joining together for very specific causes. And or they're if, or they're arguing against us. Yeah, or, or yeah, or they're arguing against us. But uh, but I think overall, the thing that's really great about it is they they aren't afraid to sit there and debate it out. And if you're wrong, you eventually come to understand that you're absolutely wrong. And then you realize, okay, I was wrong, uh, you were right, and I was being irrational. You know, there's another big difference that I've noticed um, as far as that goes. It, 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 feminists do not, um, where, where men's rights activists will argue with each other, uh, one of the reasons that feminists do not... Um, do not argue in the same way and, and there can't be discussion where you go, oh yeah you corrected me I'm incorrect I didn't realize that is a lot of feminism is about building your personal identity around victimhood and and as far as the men's rights movement is concerned it, it's about seeing problems that exist in society that have impacted on people and what can we do to make that stop and or feminists will say that about themselves, if you look at what they do as as opposed to what they just say they do, a lot of their activism is about grabbing onto that victim identity and holding tight. I mean, if you look at the recent Yes All Women hashtag, that was a, a, a just a, a masturbatory uh, fantasy of victimhood that was all that was. They just how who can be the biggest victim? It was the oppression Olympics competition of the the, the 21st airing, century, an airing of every possible grievance any feminist minded woman could ever have with men yeah. or the system. Even yeah. even imagined was yes, all women because I am afraid to walk around outside in my own neighborhood. You know this has nothing to do with whether or not men are dangerous or whether or not you're actually in, an, in any danger, that's an internal response. Being afraid to walk around in your own neighborhood is an internal thing. And, and the idea that that's harassment by the rest of society is ludicrous. But that's what they did. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge difference yep. between the two movements. It's, it's, really, it's really, like I, I, I described it as, yes, all women is not a campaign to demonize and vilify all men. It's just a campaign to explain to people why women have to be afraid of the things men do. Yeah, yeah. So and it's completely different. And they made that crystal clear yeah. when I, I linked um, I linked to a discussion with the the um, the makers of a film called "She Stole My Voice." She Stole My Voice is a uh, disturbingly graphic portrayal of people's real stories of having women's real stories of having experienced sexual assault at the hands of other women. And I I posted it with the the statement uh, because sexual violence isn't gendered. Yes, all women. Yeah. And oh my god, I got attacked for derailing. Holy shit, it was like how dare you, you know, bring this, this is, this is about men victimizing women, blah, 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 blah. And this oh. is the same people that had previously said to me, we're not demonizing men, we're not generalizing men, we're talking about female victims, and this is women's victim stories. Well, those yeah. are women's victim stories. They just don't happen to involve men. Yeah, no, I, I've often actually said that, that, you know, even looking at Mary Cross's definition of rape, in the CDC, um, looking at all of the feminist definitions of domestic violence and rape and sexual assault and all of those things, um, a lot of people, a lot of MRAs uh, think that, that the main aspect of that, the main, the main motivation behind that is to conceal male victims, but it really isn't. I don't think that feminists feel any need 
to conceal male victims because male victims garner no sympathy as victims. Um, you know, you can have you can have a male victim and a female victim of the exact same thing, and the female victim will still, you know, garner way more sympathy. Um, they aren't threatened by that. They are not threatened by the idea that men can be victims. They are threatened by the idea that women can be perpetrators. That is what they are trying to conceal, right? Mary Koss has no problems whatsoever uh, in the CDC's definitions to say that men can be rape victims when the perpetrators are other men, right? The only thing that she wants to define out of existence is women forcing sex on men. She wants to define that out of the definition of rape. She wants to make that go away. She wants to make that be about the ambivalence of, of men, their ambivalence about their own sexual desires, because a woman could never, ever, ever force a man or coerce a man into sex if he didn't actually want it on some level, right? Uh, so therefore, he's not a victim. Therefore, she is not a perpetrator. He can be a victim of another man. She's just fine with that, right? But if it was a woman, it was his ambivalence about his own sexual desires, right? And therefore, he's not a victim, and therefore, she is not a perpetrator. And that is what they are trying to conceal. That is what they are trying to cover up and, and sweep under the rug and, and, and just brush away with a hand wave, right? Female perpetrators. It's, it's really not like they're perfectly fine with the idea that gay male relationships might be violent. I have no, no problem whatsoever thinking that feminists would be okay with admitting, oh, there's probably plenty of domestic violence in gay male relationships. You mentioned lesbians. That necessitates a female perpetrator. And even when they admit it, what do they do? What do they do? They say, well, that female perpetrator was modeling the male role in a male-female relationship. She was modeling. She was enacting the masculine role in that relationship, right? It really is a need. It's a drive. It's it's like it's it's a deep seated urge to blame all violence, all all victimization, all oppression, all the bad things in the world, right, on men and masculinity, right, and absolve all females of any wrongdoing whatsoever. That is what it is. Okay, uh, is it is it all right with everyone that we go to the next question? Yes. All right. Yes. <laughs> why, uh, why is a woman who has lots of sex partners a slut and a man with a lot of sex partners a hero? P.S. I know the answer, but I'd like to hear the Badger's take. That's really not. Uh, that's really not the way things are. <laughs> um, a guy who has a lot of sex partners. Well, think about it. I mean, we learned in discussions after uh, recent news events just exactly how much esteem the public has for, say, PUAs, um, who are, are, are guys who have a lot of sex, you know, or at least whose goal is to have a lot of sex. Um, in the 80s and the 90s, we used to call them players. And, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole idea of a guy who sleeps around has been around for a long time, and the whole idea of, of, of a guy who makes it his goal to be smooth to, to, to get more pussy is is not new. I, everybody that acts like this is new has obviously never seen a Jack Lemmon movie. Um, this, this is one of the things that really irritates me. People act like this is some new thing that, that we should be... You go back to... Uh, yeah, like uh, James typed into chat here. They called him knaves in the yeah. past. You know, it, it's, it's always been condemned. Um, for men to to uh, engage in sexual activity with women and not commit to them, 
it's always been they've always been bad guys for doing that. They've yeah. always been abusers for doing that. Okay. It's okay. never been a thing where oh hey he's a hero. There are some guys that get jealous if another guy has more than they do, and there are guys who might look up to that and, and aspire to it, but there are women who do the same thing with regard to other women who have a lot of sex with a lot of different partners. So well, it, there, this is vastly, this is horribly oversimplified um, yeah. it, to a ridiculous degree by the feminist approach to it. The, the main difference is, is that a slut is seen as damaging herself by her behavior, right? Right. And a stud is seen as damaging his partners by his behavior, right? A soiled woman is a woman who has come into contact with male sexuality. There's no such thing as a soiled man. He is born into the world soiled, and he can only soil others, right? And right. the only way Jeez. that you can actually have sex and not be soiling others is if it is a union, uh, you know, endorsed by God, right? Basically, that that's the thing. Uh, the reason why men receive some amount of admiration, and, you know, yes, they're called players, they're called dogs, they're called cads, rakes, knaves, Lotharios, leches, you know, all of those things, right? But the reason why they receive some admiration is because, as James Jeffries or Jim Jeffries uh, said, there are fat, ugly sluts. There are no fat, ugly studs. Right, you know, in order to exactly. be a stud, you have to have, you know, looks, charm, a job, a fake job, the right clothes, blah blah blah. Right, in order to be a slut, you just have to be there. Right, there are there are you know midget dwarf sluts. There are no no dwarf studs. Right, and and this is what it really is. Right, like. I don't think that, that men get admiration just because penis, right, when they are sexually successful with women. But being sexually successful with women is a much more difficult and challenging task than a woman being sex, sexually successful with men. I could literally, uh, and I have literally, gone to a bar and whispered a little dirt in five guys' ears and had four of them willing to come home with me, right? And this is when I was overweight. This is when I was, you know, overweight, single mother of three, poor, you know, nothing really to offer other than sex, right? And I would have four out of five guys willing to give me a go if I was willing to agree to that. This is not the case for men. And that is why there is this sort of, sort of uh, conflict between admiration for overcoming the challenge and succeeding, right, in addition to you're harming your partners that men have. And the fact that all feminacy is the, the former, the you, you are succeeding and you get admiration for that. Right. Without actually looking at the fact that men who actually do succeed are often looked at as you're a horrible person because not because you're harming yourself, but because you're harming your partner, your partners. Right. And women who sleep around are almost unilaterally seen as harming themselves, right? So you, you still have this idea of men doing something to women, right? They're either doing something to women that makes them a winner or they're doing something to women that makes them an asshole, right? And women are letting something be done to them. 
right? And letting something be done to you is like a, t- it's like a passive role. It's harming yourself. It's allowing yourself to be harmed. You know, it, it's, I, I can completely see why being a slut is sort of universally looked down on, but at the same time, not looked down on to the degree that a player uh, you know, you look at it, uh, the guy who gets falsely accused of rape, right? Because he manipulated a woman or he talked her into it or she regretted it the next morning or whatever, right? You know, she gets called a slut. He gets to go to jail, right? Because she was only harming herself. He was harming her. Crystal? Crystal? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was a issue with the little unmute button. Um, yet it, it also, who are using the terms? Like, who's calling these women sluts? Other women. You know, if a woman's, I don't, I'm sorry, I just came back in. Um, so if this was repeated, my apologies. Uh, but if a woman has a lot of sex, other women will call her a slut. So the, the, the word slut is coming from women. If a man has a lot of sex, the word hero is coming from men. They're celebrating sexuality. There, ha- there seems to be a really big problem with the women that uh, when it comes to celebrating sexuality. I don't know why. I don't know what this is. But the ones who are shaming other sexual women are women. It's not the men who are like, oh, God, how dare that woman have lots of sex with me and, you know, yeah, no, that's not happening. It's it, other women it, who are completely shaming her. It's yelling scab at the picket line. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, it's, that's, that's really what it is. It's yelling scab at the picket line. Right. So, um, you know, men have no men have no collective interest in uh, policing slutty behavior. Um, they, they do have, they do have, men have an individual interest in, uh, in being able to find a woman who they believe will be, uh, loyal and, and, you know, and, and, uh, faithful, right? Mm -hmm. Sexually faithful to them. They have, they have a deep genetic interest in, in ensuring that the man, the woman that they are, they choose as a long-term partner is not promiscuous, right? But they don't have any interest in policing the, uh, the slutty behavior of casual sex, sex partners, right? The only people who have a vested, uh, sort of economic interest in policing the behavior, the sexual behavior of women are other women. Right. It's very odd. I don't know what it is. Is is this this like Highlander mentality? There can only be one, you know, (laughs) like the only only one. one. (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know if it's because of competition. Is that the basis? It's like, exactly how dare you have sex with the men? I absolutely come. It's it's fucking pecking order. It it goes back to right. that to that you know that old you know primate monkey shit. To be honest, really, it, it's all about right. pecking order. You look at well, those kinds of a uh, those kinds of tribal that sort of a uh, group mentality. It's you know if women want, are. If I want to say to a man, I want to say to a man. Okay, I'm going to give you the exclusive access to my vagina for the next uh, 25 to 35 years until we're one of us is dead, right? That's what I'm going to give you, and you're going to give me a, like a $15,000 engagement ring and a $2,000 wedding ring, and you're going to give me this big expensive wedding, and then you're going to support me for the rest of my life in exchange for exclusive access to my vagina, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you can get exclusive access or some access to somebody else's vagina for like $300 a month. Right. With no strings attached. Why would you give me all of that? Right. Right. Right? So so if you're looking at sex as a, as a commodity, which is scarcity, which is exactly how women and feminists and everybody, including men, view sex as a commodity. It's something to be gotten. It's something to put effort into getting, right? Uh, as far as men go, right? It's something to put effort into presenting for sale or for, you know, 
or auction or whatever as far as women. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at things in those terms, of course, of course, women would be the ones screaming slut at, you know, because, you know, women right. have, have a huge amount of power to give away sex just on an individual, individual basis to give away sex to people who want it. And men are the ones who, who are the, you know, they're the ones who are saying, I'm ready to settle down. Will you marry me for the rest of my life? Right. Right. They're the ones who propose marriage. They're the ones who propose the, the ultimate bargain. Right. And so, you know, if, if men can get sex, even just pornography, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson said, you know, pornography ain't that great. Uh, it's not, it's not that great, but when you look at the cost benefit analysis, it, it ain't bad either. Right. Isn't compared right. to the alternative. Yeah. Compared to the, I mean, I think really people just want that kind of companionship. They, they, they seek out, you know, other people and, and that's really what this all is all about. And really women are put a, putting a price on that kind of intimacy and so of course sex workers and and uh, and pro, well and porn stars and you know just all right. and just and the slutty women of course they're going to be looked down upon because they're just giving it away yeah, and well, it's, it, bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit no, it's bullshit you know it's, it's my i get so pissed sometimes i'm just like you know what all of these people who are against sex workers are like there's so many sex workers well maybe there wouldn't if you opened your legs once in a while just <laughs> fucking saying well but you know what what do you have you have you have a society that basically looks at an unattractive man as you know if an unattractive man has the temerity to desire sex he's a pervert according to peter mckay right. yeah, he's a pervert yeah. he's, he's a deviant he's 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 basically an affront to all women everywhere if he is simultaneously unattractive and desiring of sex like th- this is really what gets me is that that you you will always have a portion of the population that find it extremely difficult to get sex and human intimacy and and you know and lying together and being skin to skin with another person and i mean like they did that they did that experiment with the monkeys you know in the 1960s or maybe it was the 50s right where where they they had the the monkey raised in the pen and they had the wire mother with the nipple that offered milk and the fluffy mop mother that didn't offer anything but cuddliness right cushiness and the monkey the little baby monkey would only ever go over to the nipple just long enough to drink Right? Lost crystal. <laughs> okay, just long enough to drink the milk, right? Oh, and she would jump back into the fluffy mode. And back, damn Skype. Just, just long enough, you know, to drink the milk, to just, just satiate the, the, the absolute physical needs, and then jump over to the cuddlier mom that offered nothing but cuddliness, right? Offered nothing but the illusion of intimacy, right? And so you have you have people who who desire they desire not just sex not just sex but human intimacy they desire they want to be touched they want to be held they want to cuddle they want to lie together they want to you know just be in a space with another person in an unguarded way right and this is somehow, and I'm I'm sure I'm all, I'm positive that sex workers, a lot of them, offer all of those things, right? They don't just offer sex. Uh, I know that I have been in the position where uh, I have had a man who was in crisis knock on my window every other week, and I would invite him in and probably three quarters of our interaction was just us lying together and talking, even though neither of us 
thought it would ever go anywhere, right? And we were not, you know, we were not romantically involved. We were sexually involved, and then we were intimately tied together, you know, in the sense that we could talk on a very deep level and we could be together in an unguarded way and we were intimate and all of those things, right? And I think all humans crave that, right? And not all of us can get that without paying for it. And this is a really sad thing. And and frankly, the number of people who can't get that without paying for it who are male are going to outnumber those who are, are women, right? And so it's always going to be seen as creepy, unattractive men. The dude who starred in, you know, uh, The Human Centipede 2, right? Just like the most physically unattractive, perverted, blah, 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 right? that nobody would ever in their right minds want to have a relationship with. But if you gave somebody some money, right, and it was their job to connect with that person, right, and, and I have absolutely no doubt that there are sex workers out there who can deeply connect and, and just empathize and, and be with somebody, right, and be accepting of them. Right. This this is what really gets me is that sex work is not all about sex. It just really isn't. It really isn't all about sex. Yeah. Right. That's very true. And it's like, you know, I, I would have people who would tell me, oh, well, do the guys you sleep with are, you know, because when I was an escort, they're like, are, are they attractive? And are, are they are they ugly? I'm like, I don't there's no ugly. There, there's no such thing as an ugly person unless someone's just being a shit then that's an ugly person. But yeah. physically, there's no such thing as an ugly person. That's just, you know, a really shitty judgment. And I was like, so no, no, there never was. And, you know, they were so, they had such big hearts and they were so sweet with me and they always wished me well. And, you know, and, and even as a stripper, you know, the guys would come in and they would share with me what they didn't feel safe to share with someone they were into, you know, who they were in partnerships with. And, you know, if 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 it's that it's you know we're to a point where guys don't feel like they can actually express themselves without being completely shut down and uh, told that whatever they have to say is automatically wrong. That's not unless healthy pay, unless they're paying you, right? Right, and that that's the thing. Unless unless you're their employee, and that, that's really sad. That's absolutely mm -hmm. sad. That, that they actually, and, and it's not purchasing services. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, the money is just, it, it's just there as like a retainer against you being, you know, laughing at them and, and mm -hmm. treating them like shit for opening up. Yep. And it's amazing how women, uh, how people in general sometimes can be very callous towards men um, at, at, with a most uh, basic human need like that that yeah. is completely acknowledged if you're talking about anybody but men. I mean, even just the very basic need of experiencing human touch. Not even, it doesn't even have to be sexual touch, just touch. Right. Uh, medical science has learned that skin-to-skin -skin contact can make the difference in survival for a premature baby particularly early premature babies because there are babies that are premature that aren't really all that premature and and as you get you know farther and farther away from the due date it becomes more and more important for the baby to have that human contact and it, it, you know you think your first thought would be counterintuitive oh we don't want to expose a baby to germs we don't want to take a risk of you know, losing or anything if you don't touch those babies they die that wouldn't be counterintuitive to me that 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 like Literally, uh, all of my kids, all of my kids, uh, you know, they were they slept far better if they were in the bed with us. Yeah, yeah. Right when they were when they were very very small, right or at at arm's reach from the bed. Yeah, and it's 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 something that we know instinctively as people. Although I, I would say there is a level of counterintuition there in that. You see a preemie. A preemie is an extremely vulnerable uh, being. They're they're tiny. 
they are their immune systems are not fully formed that's one where people are going to want to protect them from everything and and that is understandable and but people how, how do you, people do go overboard with that level of protection to the point where they end up denying basic needs in all situations where people are overprotective what? but it is it is vital that human contact is absolutely vital and i don't think a lot of people um realize that it's not something that you grow out of what's, and what's the instinctive what's the instinctive way of protecting uh, an infant you gather them into your arms that's how you do it right no, it, it, and it is for most people but to be honest I've run into people who are afraid to pick babies up because they're afraid um, that they're not going to handle them properly um, of yeah. course because they've been made uncomfortable but and the tinier, like, my, my my stepdaughter could fit in the palm of your hand when she was born. You know, the tinier a baby is, the more scary it is to, to pick that baby up and, and worry that you're going to do something wrong. Um, and, and this is, you know, the, the but the approach that they learned is that the more you carry a, a baby around who is, is a, a premature baby, uh, the more that you place that baby's uh, up against your skin and as oh. much skin to skin contact as you can have that 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 makes a difference in survival now if human touch if skin to skin contact just plain contact not anything where you could say there's an intellectual thing going on there not anything that that's a consciously known thing because i mean we're talking about somebody whose whose cognitive function is at its most basic it's yeah. they're their mind isn't formed, their brain is formed, but their mind isn't formed yet. That is an instinct. That is a physical need as much as food is, which yeah. makes it incredibly shameful and incredibly abusive that society shames men for wanting this. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, they, not, it's not just shaming men for getting it. It's shaming men for that, That's what really gets me. Shaming men for desiring. Yeah, you know, they'll say that they feel that uh, that men are entitled to women's bodies. No, they desire human contact. That's that's human nature. You, you can't just you know say that that's that that's not there. You know, you can't deny well, and that. It's also, it's also bullshit because. Uh, women demand men's bodies. They act as if they are owed a man. Like, I, they just take it so casually. Like, oh, yeah, I'll just, you know, it'll happen. I'm just going to get one, whatever. I mean, there's a difference between having hope. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I could see myself in the future. And then feeling entitled to a man. Like, you don't have to do shit. You don't have to... Uh, you don't have to come forward and prove anything to him because you have vagina and that is the final statement that you have to bring. That's not enough. That's just not enough. You know, it's, we've come, our society props women up to be like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to, Hey, if he makes a request and he, you know, let's say um, there's something, a certain drink that he likes, fuck him. You're, you know, he's supposed to pay for everything. You know, don't split the meal. Don't, take him out or don't cook for him or don't make him anything. It's just like there's no effort put forward uh, for not saying all women, but you know, there's no dialogue of, Hey, when you go on a date, it's a mutual experience. If you guys want to treat each other after that's fine, you know, take turns, but it's a mutual experience, not just what is he going to do for you? What are you going to do for him? That's not, you know, it's not something that's, that's commonly said to girls. Yeah. All right. Uh, any? Uh, is it all right to, to move the next question? Uh, question? Yes. Everybody, yeah. everybody good? Every yes. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna ask uh, James' question. Uh, how would you like to see next year's conference at Seneca Falls? <laughs> during <Nice>. the <laughs> during the original convention, they told men to shut the fuck up. I say we go there and do it right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um. How, how do we feel about that? Uh, I, I'm I'm down with it. I mean, isn't that in Jersey? Let's you know, we'll, we'll go to Jersey and uh, I like the symbol of them, symbolism yeah. of. Them. I mean, yeah, that yeah. like right in their faces, right in their faces, <laughs> and and it would be perfect um, for for men to exercise their speech in the place where men were told to shut the fuck up. 
I'm sick and tired of hearing feminists tell men to shut up. It, it's a ridiculous statement, and it's a ridiculous attitude for them to have, especially when they work so hard to convince everybody that they're all about equality. And then they turn around, and as soon as an issue impacts on men, it's shut the fuck up. As soon as men have a thought on an impact, uh, an issue that impacts on women, shut the fuck up. You know, that's not an effort toward equality. It's not an effort toward uh, uh, peace between the genders. That's gender war. And, and it's unnecessary and it's ridiculous and it would be great to to just walk into that area and and uh, uh, just view the free speech taking place, the 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 networking taking place, and and the uh, the face of the movement there. Well, oh, go ahead, Crystal. Oh yeah, I yeah I I do. Yeah, it'd be great to show up there and be like, no, we will not shut the fuck up. You know. Um, yeah, I don't understand why. Uh, I don't even know why I try to understand at this point. <laughs> ah, but um, how feminism can say equality, which we, that's just a load of shit, and then tell men to shut the fuck up. I mean, oh, look at Clymer, right? Clymer. He's, he's a male feminist, and they're even telling him to shut the fuck up because apparently he and and that's an, another really big different you know difference between feminism and the men's human rights movement among so many others um there's no gender discrimination you know like nobody's telling us to shut the fuck up because we don't have a penis you know that's not that doesn't happen in the movement meanwhile in feminism just because this guy happens to be um you know happens to be a guy all of a sudden he's under strict suspicion and, you know, I don't know if you can speak in the movement or should be allowed. Meanwhile, in the Men's Human Rights Conference, there are women who are speakers. It's not an issue. Uh, but, but feminism has a really big issue with any gender beyond women. Um, you know, also, I would, I would have to say that it, it's extremely difficult Next to impossible, uh, somebody uh, give me an, ex an example of any issue, any issue, political, social, economic, whatever, that has no impact or effect on women. Any issue whatsoever, right? And, you know, uh, direct impact, uh, secondary impact, tertiary impact, whatever, on women. Please, please let me know, because I don't think there is a single issue that does not impact on women. So the dictate that men be silent on any issue that affects women is a dictate that men be silent all the time, everywhere, right? That they never speak even on issues that affect them more than women, because even issues that affect men more than women affect women, even if just indirectly through the women, uh, through the, the, the men in their lives, right? So there, there's just, it, it, it's ridiculous. And yes, there have been instances of women being uh, ousted from the men's rights community, uh, the woolly bumblebee being one, but the uh, the level of uh, the level of absolute uh, complete recalcitrance and uh, you know and complete disregard for men's feelings for their you know like for their feelings, for their experience, for everything, everything about men, you know, that, that she, uh, exemplified, you know, the, the amount of condemnation and shame she heaped on men who were only speaking to their experience, right? That was really what got it. It wasn't the fact that she had a vagina. It was the fact that she was saying stuff that, you know, I actually think she was tolerated much longer than a man saying the exact same things would have been tolerated. 
right? That a man saying what she was saying would have been booted long before she was, right? And yet you look at feminism and it has a history of booting men and uh, not booting men necessarily without cause. Uh, Hugo Schweitzer was a douchebag. Uh, Hugo Schweitzer uh, slept with his female students. He cheated on his partners. He uh, cuckolded and committed paternity fraud against another man. He attempted to kill his girlfriend uh, without there being a suicide pact. He he was just like, we're going to commit suicide together. Your decision doesn't mean anything. Um, and only a neighbor uh, prevented that from happening, smelling the gas, right? Uh, you look at uh, Kyle Payne, who was someone who did the circuit of uh, She Fears You type seminars for university students and college students uh, where, you know, he was speaking to how men can stop rape and then was convicted of uh, molesting a female co-ed and taking pictures of it when she was passed out. Um, You know, you, you have all kinds of sleazy, skeezy, male feminists who have I don't I don't know of a single other than the Wooly Bumblebee a single female MRA who has done something to that extent right you know like I I really don't think like I think that I think that feminism has a particular attraction for certain males for men who do really shitty things and feminism, what, what feminism does is it says, oh, that's not you. That's maleness that did that. That's masculinity that did that. Uh, you're not to blame. What's to blame is maleness and masculinity and cultural norms, right? And it, it's, it's, they, they portray a community of victims, right? who are uh, who almost revel in their victimhood right and so they attract predators and you know like so I, I just I don't think that the men's rights community has anything like that I, I really don't um, I think that we we tend to spot the frauds how long did Hugo Schweitzer uh, teach women's studies? and gender studies and you know commit his frauds how how long did he go and how long did the woolly bumblebee take us all for a ride she took us all for about six months and then we booted her out right hugo schweitzer was years and years wow because yeah because he was he was telling them what they wanted to hear i'm a man and i'm bad All right, uh, can we fit in one last question? <laughs> sure. All right, uh, gosh. I'm just going to try and end this in the silly place because we, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, dog goes woof, cat goes meow, bird goes tweet, and mouse goes squeak. Cow goes moo, frog goes croak, and the elephant goes toot. Duck says quack, and fu- uh, fish go blub, and the seal goes ow, ow, ow. But there's one sound that no one knows. What does the badger say? <laughs> The badger says. <laughs> badger says, uh, "I don't give a fuck." <laughs> the badger says, "Fuck perpetual victimhood." Exactly, Crystal. <laughs> Badgers hiss. Badgers hiss. They don't. They don't. Oh. They, they, they hiss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, badger says, uh, "I don't know." <laughs> as, says, a, as as opposed to the fox. The fox is like, the fox actually screams. Doesn't it? Doesn't it also yiff? What? Really? <laughs> foxes, foxes scream. Actually, you can, you, can, you can search what the fox really says. <laughs> and show a fox, and they scream. Oh my god, that's terrifying. 
Yeah, but yeah, in they, the perfect community, they're always like, uh, it, they, they think that foxes go yiff. No. <laughs> foxes, foxes fucking scream. They scream. That's terrifying. Don't bobcats do oh, that too? Is it bobcats? Yeah. Creepiest is the creepiest I fucking thing. I used to listen to it when I was living on the North Island. I used to listen to foxes and elks, and they sounded remarkably similar. Oh my god. I, I know I heard one. I don't know if it was a bobcat or what, but it sounded like a baby screaming. It's the creepiest sound I've ever heard. Yeah, no, they, 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 it's, it's, it's a really, really fucked up sound. <laughs> but yeah, go on YouTube, search what, does the, what the fox really says, right? And then uh, search uh, badger hissing or whatever, right? Because <laughs> they, they don't really, badgers don't make a whole lot of noise, Right, like they don't they don't call to each other or anything right, so much. They're pretty quiet. They're, they are pretty quiet. They're plotting. They're plotting. They they are actually. There's there's a really awesome video of uh, a honey badger named Stoffel. Uh, Is that the one who kept getting dis um, escaping? Kept yes, es- yes, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and he did so with his partner too. Yeah, yeah, when when they cleared the trees out of his pen, he he rolled rocks. Yes. To, to yeah. climb, and then when they got rid of all the rocks, he dried mud balls and that rolled up. That was incredible. Right? Yeah, no. And then if they left a, a rake in his pen, he would bra- drag the rake over and and put it up and escape. Right? Yeah. Like he he was, you know, like honey badgers. They have one of the largest brains uh, relative to body size um, of any animal. And uh, and predators have much more analytical brains uh, than prey animals, right? So you have this animal who is like the ultimate predator, who, who you know, most predators, they eat, they, they hunt, and then they eat, and then they rest, right? Honey badgers hunt, and then eat, and then go on the hunt again immediately, right? Even if they're bit by a snake, even if they're bit by a oh, cobra, yeah. they wake up, they finish eating, and they go move on and hunt again, right? Because they are ravenous, right? And so their brains are always, always, always on the go. And this is this is one of the things that I find just really admirable about. Uh, it's not so much that that honey badgers are the most fearless animals, but they're they're one of the smartest out there, which is is interesting too. So. Cool. Badger, badger. Well, badger. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I was gonna do that. Badger, badger, badger. <laughs> um, are we? Are we? Are we? Are we out of time? I think we're. I think we're out of time. Yeah, uh, we're it's that time again. Yeah. What? We're at nine oh three, so we must be out of time. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to thank everybody who has been working out. You know, behind the scenes, uh, our lovely uh, Karen Strawn and and Hel- uh, Hannah Wallen and, and James, who does everything and the technical aspects in the background and and crystal being her awesome self and uh and thank you to our to our uh, those who've helped us out so generously with the fundraiser yes thank uh, you <laughs> so you know Thanks. what to do uh we'll be here um well I, I think we're taking a break next week are we not I think, I think uh we're... not sure quite probably uh in preparation in yeah preparation. Yeah. We're going to be uh, getting our Kevlar together. <laughs> yeah, our Kevlar, so. of course. Uh. But you know that we will return. Same Badger time, same Badger station. Good night and good luck. Jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with bite.